Okay, first of all, could I just get you to say your name and spell it for us? Madeline Redfern, M-A-D-E-L-E-I-N-E, -E -E, Redfern, R-E-D-F-E-R-N. Could you tell me a little bit about, um, first of all, why you became mayor? I ran for election because I'm from al Khalwi. This is my community, and uh, I'm very passionate about the issues and wanting to ensure that uh, as this community grows and develops, that it's done so in a responsible manner and with the engagement of all our different community members and stakeholders. What are some of the issues that you really wanted to focus on when you became mayor? Uh, good governance and uh, making sure that, as I said, that what the city is uh, doing in respect to delivering programs and services is that uh, it is doing so in a manner that um, meets the needs of all our citizens, uh, especially the Khalwit, the Inuit from Khalwit. Um, we have a large growing population here. It's doubled in size in the last 10 years. And we grow at about 300 or more per year. So every three years, we have a new thousand residents. So you can imagine there's a lot of challenges and the people who are originally from here, you know, who are not part of the transient population, um, want to be ensured that this community um, still is their home community and reflects uh, and meets their needs. What are some of the changes that are really evident because of the growth? We've noticed lots of construction. Um, what, what are some of the problems with that? Well, it's, uh, we've got issues um, that we're very much aware of and monitoring, looking at um, when our water source is going to run out and the fact that we need to ensure that we actually have a new water source in place uh, before then. Working with uh, territorial government, our power um, plant, uh, it's... Um, Age life is 40 years, and it's actually now 44 years old, and so they've done some upgrades. But you know, with the growth that we have, we want to make sure that we have uh, power because without power, our community doesn't function. I mean, our lights, um, you know, and all electricity, basic services. So it becomes a, a health and public safety issue. So those are just a couple of the sort of the extreme issues. Um, but you know, at the community level. It's this large influx of new people. It's a boom town or boom city situation. And of course, that brings you know, opportunity and benefits. Um, but it also brings some issues because you have communities within communities. And sometimes they become disconnected or fractured. So um, as the mayor and with the city, we find it our role to find ways in which to try to um, make sure that uh, the different um, individuals in our, in our community learn to understand and respect each other. Um, otherwise, we end up in a situation, as we do now, where some people get into trouble with the law. There's those conflicts, there's those frustrations and stresses. Uh, you talked about water. Um, climate change is going to affect this area like it is affecting everywhere, but it seems to be a little more up here. What are some of the issues you're having to deal with with climate change? Well, we're uh, monitoring um, what's happening with the permafrost. Uh, we lay in our water and sewage pipes um, into our new subdivisions, and we've already had some breakages uh, of pipes that were just laid only a couple of years ago. Um, so we need to uh, monitor that to see what is actually happening. It's huge costs when a pipe breaks. Um, you know, there's all the associated costs of actually getting a, a contractor in, digging up through the permafrost, um, in and around houses. So you can find yourself spending here, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, when a pipe breaks. So it's significant. It's something that we have to be very cautious and aware of and, and assess what our options are, whether or not in the future um, it's, it makes more sense to build the pipes above ground um, or we have uh, some of our houses actually have truck services so the water is delivered to the homes by trucks and then with water tanks in the homes and the sewage is pumped out. I know that um, the city doesn't deal with uh, education as, as much as the territory does. What are some of the educational issues that you're dealing with with the young ones when you were talking about communities melding correctly and then and cultural differences being explained. What kinds of things do you like to see happening in the schools or some of the other programs that the city is running? Well, the fact that uh, the city doesn't deliver education doesn't mean that we're not very concerned about education. For the reason is that uh, we need to increase the, our graduation rates. Right now, they're only at 25%. So that means 75% of our children across the territory are not graduating grade 12. That is our workforce. And um, 
in addition is that there are a whole bunch of jobs and opportunities, but if you don't have, you know, literacy or, you know, some quality education, then you can't take advantage of those. So then you end up with people going, you know, from dropping out of school to living in, you know, overcrowded housing uh, situations. So we have two, three or four generations living in a home because they can't move out when they're adults because they don't have a job and they don't have access to uh, other housing because our housing stock is quite limited. Um, you might find, you know, people, it increases the number of people living on social assistance. It increases the risk factor for them getting into trouble with the law. Um, not saying that people who don't graduate school are going to become criminals. It's just that these are all risk factors that play into whether or not someone's going to do well and be productive and be healthy or they're going to have, you know, be less healthy, less productive, and possibly get into, you know, issues of addictions or um, conflicts. So education is key. It's one of our priority issues that we must, you know, have our children um, stay in school, get a quality education. Many of our uh, Inuit want to have increased uh, Inuit curriculum and language in their school. Um, it's natural when you think about, you know, your, your child being educated in your culture, in your language. It's actually quite foreign to think about, you know, if you had to send your child into a completely different cultural and language and education system. Um, and there's uh, uh, a lot of thought that, you know, but the fact that it, there is that educational cultural disconnect means that uh, kids feel foreign. In the, in the environment that they're being taught in, um, and that we need to have more Inuit uh, teachers and uh, a sense of, um, of knowledge. Um, both, I'm not saying that we just need an Inuit um, curriculum. We need a blending of the two um, so that they can benefit from the best of both education systems. Unfortunately, you know, despite them being educated in English, we're getting a lot of kids who don't have good literacy or numeracy in English. And that's been their whole education is in, in that system and we're failing them there. So we absolutely need to kids to stay in school, but as I said, with a quality education so that when they do come out at the other end is that they are you know, able to, take, to go on to post-secondary education or that they're able to uh, get employed in, in much better jobs than just the lower level entry jobs. Because it's actually, it, if you take it from a financial perspective, either they're an expense or they're revenue for you, and you want to get them under the revenue side of the, of the books. Are there examples of, of things that are working here? Absolutely. Um, Iqaluit is lucky because we actually have the Arctic College um, campus here. Every community does, but the one in here in Iqaluit is, a, is more of a regional campus, so there's a lot more um, educational programs available here. So not only do community members from Iqaluit attend that college, but other um, people from other communities attend. Uh, there are, you know, uh, successes. Uh, we have um, uh, Inuit who are graduated law school, uh, teachers, uh, bachelors, nursing degrees. Now we're about to offer um, an administ uh, what is it called? Um, a bachelor of administration. Um, so it is exciting. The numbers are small, but we have to start somewhere. Um, and uh, so those are some of the successes that I definitely see in the education area. Did you want to pass it on to the education system? Uh, just one then. There is, uh, obviously, the, the state's in its infancy. And with all the changes and the dynamics going on, there is, seem to be a, a lot of expectations okay, in terms of what people would like to see. Uh, what are some of those priorities in terms of the infrastructure, the challenges that you have to meet to satisfy those growing demands? The, probably the, the most pressing one to meet sort of, um, you know, the needs of 300 new residents a year is uh, us being able to survey and develop lots. And uh, it's not just a simple question of um, having a surveyor go out there and draw lines um, on our land, but it's also a question of, um, of laying in the road and laying in the pipe so that uh, when um, uh, someone who wishes to purchase a lease or a contractor wishes to build is that that basic infrastructure is already in place. Um, 
the landscape here is, is very different. It, I mean, just for us to uh, build a mile of road is half a million dollars. And that's not a paved road. That's just a gravel road. Um, and then you wish to pave it, that's probably you know an, another million dollars. Um, we only have $38 million revenue a year. Um, so it's, it's a challenge, as I said, to meet all the needs um, and making sure that people have water, their garbage is uh, you know, taken away, the roads are cleared, uh, we have a swimming pool and other recreational facilities. Um, this level of government has to work because if it doesn't, you know, believe me, I'll have people on the phone calling me saying, I don't have water. And then I, in turn, will, you know, call my public works department and I'll get an update, you know, oh, pipe went down and then try to estimate how long and we will work at it until it gets fixed. So it's, it's a challenge, but we have to, of course, meet those needs because they're basic services. And just like any aspects of education, as you said, you have to meet the basic needs first before you can start addressing some of the others. But the, the one other that we had talked about earlier, perceptions of culture and then people perceiving the North being such a different culture. What are some things that other people across Canada and from the South have to begin to understand about the Inuit culture as part of that Canadian mosaic? Yeah, well, Inuit culture in some respects is, is very unique and different than other cultures in so much that uh, our relationship with the land and in particular with our wildlife is, is a little different in so much that uh, we live in the Arctic and so um, our local food culture or a 100 mile diet is very different than that of someone in Toronto. Um, our 100 mile diet consists of seals, caribou, whale, polar bears, ducks, geese, arctic char, um, um, clams. Um, and so if we, you, if we were to lay out you know, the, our local food, it would look fairly different than that uh, of what is found uh, you know, in southern Ontario or Alberta or British Columbia. Um, that's not to say we don't supplement our diet with southern foods. Um, but it's very expensive because everything has to be flown in. Um, other than in the summertime where non-perishable foods can be shipped in. So, you know, I could spend anywhere from about $15 for four liters of milk, about $7 for my loaf of bread, um, $10 for a bag of oranges, or $10 for a head of, uh, of cauliflower. Um, it's a, a food and our sort of um, our relationship to, uh, to our culture um, is something that uh, is different. But nonetheless, uh, it, you know, it, as long as it's sustainable, which it is, um, we should embrace you know, cultural diversity, which includes uh, a difference uh, not only in language, uh, world viewpoints and understanding with our environment, our, uh, a different food uh, d uh, cultural diversity, um, and that I think it's amazing and wonderful that uh, in Canada we are a multicultural society um, and it's beneficial for us to learn about the different cultures and to have tolerance and respect for each other. Um, and uh, so when sometimes you know people see images of, um, of Inuit hunting or eating, you know, um, um, let's say a, a seal that's being cut up, you know, on the floor and, and it's raw or it's frozen, um, it's nutritious, it's uh, sustainable, um, and I find most people who, you know, begin to open up their mind and begin to sort of understand um, that uh, um, the relationship that we have with our environment and land, then um, people tend to sort of become a little bit more aware and, um, and less judgmental. So it's... Uh, uh, Cultural diversity is a good thing. Some of the politics we've had to deal with, with the seal, with the polar bear, um, actually comes down to dollars and cents for the people here. Um, the latest, the, um, the polar bear just was rated as not um, special, special. But, yeah. special concern. Right, and so that can actually have a, a, an effect on the pocketbook of, of hunters here. Absolutely. Um, while 
most Inuit do harvest uh, our Arctic animals for food. The ability to sell the byproduct um, allows uh, those hunters to um, support their family. It gives them cash income for other things like, you know, to purchase uh, goods from the store. Um, a polar bear sports hunt, um, if, you know, sold to a southerner is required to be done by dog team. So it, uh, it supports that cultural aspect. Um, owning and, and managing a tom dog team is full-time work year-round, year after year. That's a special knowledge and um, it would be sad to see that gone. Also too is that uh, only um, about 20% of our uh, polar bears um, from our quota is actually um, put towards a sports hunt. So it's a very small percentage. Um, also, if um, a sports hunt is not successful, that polar bear quota or tag is actually not used. So there's a quite a big percentage of, uh, of unsuccessful hunts and it's actually um, very sustainable. It fulfills the conservation purposes. Um, uh, as well as the sale of the seal pelt, um, you know, it's, it's allows the hunter to help offset the cost of hunting. So the purchasing of their equipment, their bullets, the gas. Hunting's actually quite expensive. Um, but, as I said, its significance and value is not just as food production, but also as a cultural um, activity. It's, uh, it's a different way of life, but it's just as valid as, let's say, someone in the South wanting to be a farmer and the relationship that they have. It's a, they're a food producer, but also it's uh, their very close relationship with the land and it helps feed many others. A commercial farmer down south, you know, is not just feeding his family. The same thing with our hunter here is not just feeding his family, it's also feeding a whole community. Um, and it's really important, especially um, a recent study showed that 70% of our Inuit preschool children are food insecure. What does that mean? Those children are not being able to eat regularly, and 25% of them are severely food secure. So they're missing meals regularly. And I think that some of that is a result of the fact that many of our hunters no longer are getting the cash benefits from the sale of the byproducts that allow them to do the hunt or continue hunting. And there is no replacement income. In many cases, you just end up on social assistance and you're supposed to feed your family or yourself with $9 a day on social assistance. And when I just told you that a loaf of bread can, you know, be $7 or a head of, uh, of cauliflower is, is $10, that is why you're unable to, uh, you know, really feed your family on social assistance. It's vitally important, and the studies have shown that if you have a hunter in the house, your food security levels are significantly greater. So how do you feel about politicians using polar bears as, in, as kind of the flagship for climate change? It's a, an iconic um, animal, and, uh, you know, it, it becomes an emotive issue, um, or, um, uh, but... I can tell you that a polar bear, you know, is incredibly important culturally for Inuit, not just as a food source. It's, a, it's an animal that is revered. Uh, the number, you know, of polar bears that are actually harvested um, is actually is sustainable and quite small. Um, and that Inuit absolutely, you know, want to ensure that the polar bear's survival, you know, um, is strong. Um, and there is, um, we need to find some way in which scientists, the polar bear biologists, and Inuit who possess, you know, that knowledge, find ways to work together. Um, and it's not saying that uh, uh, the two knowledges are, you know, are, are identical. They're different viewpoints. There are some similarities and there are some distinct differences. Um, and I think that uh, Inuit and Western, you know, society can benefit um, from having a collaborative approach. I've seen it be successful in Alaska with respect to whales, where, where scientists were counting the whales off the, off the shore and um, the numbers were actually quite low and the indigenous population said, said, no, 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 there's way more whales than that. And why? Because you're counting from a fixed area on the shore with binoculars and the whales can go much further than that 
or they can actually um, swim long distances and you're not catching them because you know they haven't surfaced um, and you're only um, uh, counting them for a short period of time. So the Western science um, scientists listened to the indigenous people and found alternative ways in which to count you know, uh, the whale population and they redid their uh, survey and found that there were significantly more whales. And you know, that benefits Western science and Western culture and society to have better accurate information to, for wildlife management, but it also benefits the indigenous people who knew that there were more, um, more whales. So that's just an example where I see an opportunity, you know, for that partnership and that, uh, you know, um, problematic or poor science, which is used to make political decisions or policy decisions, um, at the end of the day, doesn't really even end up achieving, you know, the the policy objectives. So that's why I think that um, there is a need for Inuit to understand Western science, and we need Inuit to actually get educated in Western science, and for Western scientists to be aware and work with um, our Inuit who are on the land and our hunters who are out there, you know, 365 days a year, season in, season out. Um, and some of that knowledge is also not just their own individually, but what they have learned from other hunters, but also what they've learned from their father and from their grandparents. So that body of knowledge is actually very rich and uh, um, it needs to be respected. And as I said, uh, um, um, not just used on a sort of a cursory um, sort of, uh, well, we talked to some elders, and then it's a question about, but how did you interpret it? And how was it included and incorporated in the conclusions? Um, it's important that uh, um, certain elements aren't just cherry-picked, but actually sort of a proper you know, engagement with uh, each side on the analysis and an engagement uh, of both Inuit and Western scientists on the conclusions. I think uh, makes for uh, better science. Anything else? That was great. Good. Thank you very much.